All right, friends, I am thrilled to welcome Kaylin Marcotte to the show today. Kaylin, are you joining us from New York? I am currently in Miami, actually. I'm splitting time and uh, escaping the winter for a little bit. Oh my goodness. I love it. The snowbird life. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm just skipping ahead to the early retirement schedule. That's incredible. Well, that's kind of the beauty of being an entrepreneur, right? You don't have to go through life milestones according to schedule, so to speak. Kaylin, I, I just briefed you that you know what makes our show unique is we ask entrepreneurs the business questions you can't Google. So I won't have you go full into your backstory, although it is fascinating. So I mean, I'm just saying if you guys want to give her a quick Google, <laughs> you will be impressed. But Kaylin, could you just share with us one piece of it, which is what what was the catalyst for you to go from employee to entrepreneur? We call it the cubicle to CEO story. What was yours? Yeah, mine happened really organically and 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 kind of took a while. I originally had the idea for Jiggy in like 2015 and ended up launching in 2019. So, you know, I was at a startup at the time myself as an employee and I was really enjoying the work there and I was kind of fulfilled professionally. And so this, the idea and kind of this, the confidence, the conviction in it, the desire to, to really go out on my own and do it really built over that time. And it started, so the, the media startup I was with previously is called The Skim. Um, and it was during those early skim days that I started doing puzzles and fell in love with them as my form of meditation. So it was really kind of a slow burn, if you will, a pretty organic just development of falling in love with puzzles, wanting to, to reinvent them, to elevate them, to modernize them, having this vision for it, but still not being quite sure, you know, um, still working full time. And then ultimately got more and more um, just, yeah, conviction in the idea. I saw adult coloring books and, you know, this mindfulness conversation and everyone trying to figure out how to combat burnout. And um, I just got more and more inspired that, hey, there might actually be a business here, not just a hobby of mine, but there may be, there's actually an appetite for this and a business to be built. And I want to be the one to do it. Um, and so after, you know, four years basically of, of, softly developing thinking of this idea, ended up pulling the trigger, you know, still um, took my time. I was self-funding it. So was still taking on clients and doing some consulting in the meantime and ended up launching in 2019. And what, correct me if I'm wrong, but was 2019 the year that you also went on Shark Tank or was that a later year? That was later. Yeah. The company was only a few months old when I first got connected to Shark Tank, um, but ended up airing on the show in early 2021. Oh, wait, wow. Right. Because they film usually about a year, a year before it airs. Yeah. Interesting. Exactly. Okay. So I loved Jiggy from the moment that I saw it on Shark Tank. That was actually <laughs> where I first um, you know, came across your brand. I'm sure many others Amazing. as well. I just thought it was so brilliant. I love this return to uh, childhood characteristics like imagination, creativity. I think it's yeah, so play. important that play, yes, mm. that was things that we lose as adults. So, for people who are brand new to Jiggy, could you just give us a quick overview of what makes Jiggy different in the puzzles world? Why should people uh, play and 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 create with your puzzles? Yeah, definitely. So again, you know, I started doing puzzles when I was just burning out and working long hours as my kind of form of meditation and stress relief. Um, I found them, you know, it was, it was an activity. So it kept my mind occupied and present and really focused, but it was relaxing enough that I really did feel, um, you know, kind of relief at the end of the night versus like turning on TV and just kind of going, zoning out and going brain dead, I actually felt very present when I was doing puzzles. And so the thing, once I started thinking about, okay, now how, what, what would I bring to this? You know, the, the puzzle world industry, how would I want to do it differently? And so there were um, three major things. One was the designs themselves. So all the ones I was doing at the time were like, cheesy stock photography, you know, the same like landscapes or animals. And um, so I really wanted to um, elevate the design. You're spending, 
anywhere from six to 12 hours, you know, studying every detail of this image when you're putting it together. So wanted to, to do that. And I had grow, growing up, my mom had founded an arts nonprofit. So I was always passionate about the arts, surrounded by the art community. So our kind of first big differentiator is that each of our puzzle designs is original artwork by an emerging female artist who gets a percentage of every sales. We do profit sharing with these artists and really want to give you know their work a, a platform to be in, interacted with in a new way. It's one thing I think to look at a print or you know look at um, even an original on the wall, and it's another to really kind of co-create it and interact with it and have art just be much more accessible. And so that was um, the first thing. The second was, it's like, all right, now we have these beautiful designs. So how are we going to present them and display them? And I wanted much more of kind of an unboxing experience and beautiful packaging, very giftable. Um, so we kind of re reimagined, re-engineered the puzzle box and the pieces come in a reusable glass jar. So you can see them through and, you know, display them, put them back into the jar, display them, and it would look perfectly curated on a nice living room shelf. Um, so the packaging was, was second. And then third was kind of my pain point of what do you do with a puzzle once you're done with it? You know, you spend hours and hours doing this thing. Once it's done, you know, it's like 24 by 18 inches. Like it's this big print, essentially. I was too sentimental to tear it apart right away. So um, we include puzzle glue with each one and it goes right on the top. It dries clear and essentially binds the pieces to turn it into wall art. So those are our big, you know, differentiators. Um, of course, there are so many uh amazing things about just puzzles in general of improved memory and sleep and decreased dementia and Alzheimer's and um, wellness and mental health and just fun and analog and, you know, doing it with friends or family and quality time. And then specifically, you know, why Jiggy? It was really those three supporting emerging artists, you know, very elevated, um, giftable packaging, and then puzzle glue to preserve it once you're done and turn it into art. Just listening to you talk, I feel like you have such deep understanding of audience, which I love because, you know, you really approached it from the aspect of, okay, this this generation and and younger, right, millennials, Gen Z, what are the things we care about? We care about, uh, you know, supporting the work of creatives and, and small businesses, and we, we love – and prioritize aesthetic in our homes, yes. and it's in, and it's experiential. Like you've created an experience, and to your point, the accessibility to art, which I think is really cool, because I'm someone who appreciates art, but I feel like does not have a, a like a. a a, a educational background in art. So it, it can feel very intimidating, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're like, go buy art, I'm like, I don't even know <laughs> where to start, but right. to, to work with one of your puzzles and then get to keep that as art and use that as a, as a way to discover new artists, I think is just incredible. So huge exactly. kudos to you Absolutely. for elevating yeah. that. And I, I have, I have to say as well, I have a women's co-working space here in, in Oregon and it's an extension of our Cubicle to CEO online community in person. And I actually did buy a puzzle to um, just have it in the, you know, in the, in the space for people who want to break from work and, and to do that. So I definitely need to grab some jiggy puzzles to yes. add to the collection. <laughs> oh, for sure. We have to get you some jiggies. It's great team building. We've heard, you know, I feel like the, the old like stereotypical like startup ping pong table or whatever. We've actually heard from more and more people who have like a puzzle table and you come do a few pieces and chat over it and kind of water cooler, you know, get to know uh, each other. And it can be a nice activity to just, you know, have something to do, keep your, your hands distracted, but be able to connect with people. That's beautiful. Now I want to get into our case study because it's really, really interesting. As you, as you all know, if you clicked play on this episode, ninety-seven times increase in your content reach with your partnership with Casey Musgraves, and we'll we'll use Casey Musgraves and, and your collaboration with her as you know the focal point. But really, for anyone listening, this is part of Kaylin's and Jiggy's larger strategy of platform or puzzles as a platform, which I think is really interesting. I think it's a really uh, unique audience growth strategy. So 
maybe maybe let's start a little bit high level first. Like, what what is uh, Puzzles as a platform, and and then we can get into your specific partnership with Casey. Yeah. So you know, once the brand, so I launched just direct to consumer with these curated designs. And then as I started, as we were, you know, in the market and live and, and had some more visibility and, and people were reaching out to us, um, there were just these brands that I loved and whether it was, was another like, you know, consumer brand or, um, or bigger corporate and they were looking to engage employees or, um, or someone like he's, you know, entertain someone with such a, a community around them, nonprofits, you know, who have such um, buy-in and such engagement, but you know, are looking for ways to monetize that and to to provide new and um, kind of surprise and delight their their audiences. So as those conversations started to develop, you know, there was there's always been something to me kind of inherently. Um, of course, like gamified about puzzles, but it's this way to to really engage, you know, a, a typical ad that companies spend, you know, millions of dollars on on TV for 30 seconds. Like you spend eight to 10 hours with a puzzle, like how much, you know, more kind of um, of a of a long term touch point with your brand can you get than than someone literally piecing together you know your beautiful imagery with your logo on it or a new announcement and um, and perhaps it's like an unlock and they have to do the puzzle to to learn what the new the new thing is so we started just internally brainstorming all of these things and um, it kind of just just connected the dots that really the you know the puzzle itself is a vehicle and for you know most of our puzzles it's a vehicle for art and you know that's our whole structure with our artists that the puzzle you know it's chipboard it's ink we cut it and so it's really it's this 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 vehicle for art but with brands what does that look like and what can it be a vehicle for and it's usually a message or a moment that they want to celebrate and recognize. So started really kind of building out this, this value proposition of puzzles as a platform and what are the kind of use cases and how can we um, make it something that would really amplify a, a, a new product release or a fundraising effort or an awareness day. Um, and so we started working with some nonprofits and some brands, and then ultimately connected with Universal Music Group team, and um, and had the idea to do something around Casey's album release. And which album release was that? This was um, last November. It was Star Crossed. So it was kind of, and she hasn't. It, it was kind of toted as like her. Um, divorce album and so there you know star-crossed lover like a, a heartbroken heart and um a lot of like cloud imagery um she the album cover it's kind of her head in the clouds is is what the title is but very kind of angelic um casey profile in the clouds um and it was awesome we got to meet you know she had a, a pre-release um well uh, listening and and they did a full like short film essentially that was much more you know than a than a music video um, a film of the whole album and so they did a screening of that and we got to go and just hear a little bit more about what this album meant to her and kind of the full um, range of emotions and um, and you know phases of of uh, going through a breakup and divorce and how that was brought to life in the music, um, and so it was yeah very very cool thing to be a part of. Absolutely, I mean I I love Casey. I love her. I think of all of her albums. Golden Hour is by far the most played on my on my playlist. But I I am nerding out over just. You're so I didn't even think of that point honestly until you mentioned the extended touch point of someone being with your puzzle and like visually constructing it for 8 to 10 hours. My inner advertising marketing nerd is like thinking, <laughs> I'm so excited. I mean, I <laughs> I think I think that what you bring to the table 
is so unique. I mean, maybe not so much in um, this may not apply as much in Casey's case, because obviously as an artist, as a music artist, you do have physical goods, like people could buy a CD or posters or whatever it is. But I think for a lot of other brands, you mentioned you work with nonprofits, you work with, um, you know, other emerging brands that may not necessarily sell physical products. And Mm -hmm. this kind of allows their community to have some sort of tangible touch point or tangible experience with them in a way that they normally can't. So I I think this is brilliant as an advertising platform. I'm curious when you connected to Universal Music Group, was this an idea they had proposed to you or was this something you had to go in and pitch? And if the latter, how did you approach that conversation? Yeah, we so I got connected to someone on their licensing team and we um, really kind of developed the idea together. I was pitching it certainly as, you know, a... Um, you know, for music, for whenever I puzzle, and again, most of the ideas and kind of uh, initiatives have come very organically, because for me, when I am doing a puzzle, obviously, you're doing something with your hands, but I usually have some kind of audio, you know, an audio book, great music, like there's, um, you're looking for, for an audio experience while you're doing a puzzle. So um, I thought what a great pairing while you're, you know, especially a, a new album. Um, so we connected with them and we started with two, this Casey was one of them. And then they also at, around the same time had discovered a recorded but never released album of Ella Fitzgerald. And um, it was called the Berlin, like the secret Berlin tapes. Um, And so they were, it was like a nightclub, jazz club, and uh, they had never been released. So we did the same for them. And again, sticking with, you know, our, our whole mission of, of supporting emerging female artists, Um, you know, Ella Fitzgerald Foundation has a whole uh, nonprofit around teaching kids music and, and music education. And so it just felt so aligned um, to focus on the their female um, roster. And so, yeah, once we um, kind of aligned on this concept that how much fun would it be not only to just, again, surprise and delight the audience, give them a new way to engage, a new piece of merch, again, yes, posters and maybe like a vinyl was, you know, the classics, but let's bring something unexpected that um, that we haven't seen before. And so have that offering and, you know, to you pour a glass of wine or get a, you know, some tea and put on good music and do a puzzle. And it's just the perfect kind of combination. Um, and so they, they totally saw, saw it, saw the vision and we were aligned there. And so then choosing artists who were very, um, consistent with our mission and messaging as a brand um, to start. And so that's how, that's how we landed on those two as our first partnerships. I am so impressed. I'm, I'm serious. The light bulbs are going off in my brain. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, seriously, like I, I'm just over here. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'm nerding out because I, I, love, <laughs> I love the blend of the experiences. I can see I mean, I'm sure maybe you've already done this or or are thinking of doing this, but the the blend of audio and tactical with mm-hmm. someone experiencing something, listening to something while also engaging physically with their hands, I feel like that's like such a perfect, like you mentioned, an unexpected place for for puzzles to maybe show up, but for yeah. book releases, for podcast shows, I mean, audio is really the future of media. So I can only imagine that the landmine of opportunity for Jiggy is ever expanding. That's so cool. Have you done one with an audiobook or with a podcast yet? We haven't yet. No, we could be the first. Um, <laughs> no, I think, yes, audiobooks for sure. That's my, those are my two um, podcasts, audiobooks, and music is like my puzzle ritual. And yes. so, um, yeah, and and usually something to good, something to drink. So you know, bundling <laughs> together the whole experience um, is is definitely something we have our eye on. 
Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, post post production. <laughs> sorry, sorry, listeners. You won't be privy to this, but I do actually have an idea. I have to run by you now with this oh my gosh. With this inspiration moment. So, anyways, back to back to the case study for now. So, your partnership with Casey went live, and it, I mean, wildly increased your content reach ninety seven times. Did you notice that right away? Was that literally on launch day? You saw that spike in in stats or was it kind of gradually building over a period of weeks or months? It was pretty immediate. We launched, um, you know, we wanted to go. The album came out in end of October. So we, um, you know, we, we went live then, but we saved most of our social promotion for a little bit closer to the holidays and getting, you know, they had a lot of press release just around the album itself. So we wanted to um, create kind of a a secondary, another moment for the puzzle. And so um, we went live in mid-November or or started really heavily promoting on social mid-November and then into, of course, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday and holiday gifting. And so I think, you know, her post was like, uh, Casey's first post was like puzzled about holiday gifts. Like, haha, I had to like puzzle pun or something and, you know, sharing the designs. And so, yeah, it was, it was pretty immediate out of the gate, just seeing the power of, um, of her community and audience. I, I love a good pun, so I don't I don't. Fall. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I I would love to know though when when she promoted, um, were you guys doing any? I don't even remember if Instagram had released this feature yet at that time. I think they had the co-authored post. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you you can right. or was that not even a thing yet? I can't remember. That wasn't even a thing yet. I think what we were able to do and tried was essentially boosting like from her profile. Um, so that was on the paid side, just on the organic side, we couldn't yet. Yeah. Do the, the, um, the Collab post co-authored or whatever. Yeah. yeah. The partnership that you mentioned. Um, so they did live separately on each of our feeds. Um, but we, you know, directed to the same pages and stuff. So could, could track, um, not only the, the social reach, but then actual conversion, the click through and conversions. Okay. We're here with Kaylin for lightning round. Kaylin, question number one, what phone app do you use the most? Oh, I wish it weren't Instagram, but it probably is Instagram or Slack. My team, we use Slack internally. And um, so I'm on that try to get away from email. And so uh, we slack all day long. Don't even feel bad. I'm the same, same answer. (laughs) (laughs) Question number two, I thought this would be appropriate because you were the first, throwing back to your employee days, you were the first employee at the skim. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious at Jiggy, who was your first hire and and why, if you want to throw in that bonus? Yeah. My first full-time hire is kind of our Jill of all trades ops lead. Her name's Megan. And, you know, for me coming from Fisk and Judy's my first physical product. So just all the day-to-day logistics, manufacturing, fulfillment, where's the package, you know, what check the tracking. Um, uh-oh, like it, the glass broke, you know, all the, the day-to-day logistics that is brand new to me. Um, I know I needed some support on. So first hire was, was ops help. Very smart. Yes. The fulfillment piece is always the trickiest. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. All right. Final question. How many puzzles, and you can give a ballpark because I know this is pretty specific. How many puzzles have you completed in your life if you had to estimate? Oh my gosh. Let's see. I was doing about a puzzle a week. That is so what? So 52 weeks in a year. <laughs> so 52. So probably like a couple hundred there. And then... I've done every single one that Jiggy's made, which is like 100 of our collection ones. So I would say 300 puzzles. Wow. My mind. <laughs> wow. That is way impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Speed puzzler now. Yeah. One <laughs> thing sometimes. <laughs> I think maybe you should look in the, what is it, the Guinness World Record book. You might, yeah. you might be coming up on that. <laughs> exactly. That's amazing. 
So I do want to get into the click-throughs and conversions or as much as you're willing to share. But before we do that, I, I want to just spend a few more minutes on this content launch strategy just because I know for our listeners, not all of you work with physical products. Not all of you may be trying to license with another brand, but I do think we can all learn from this case study in how Jiggy and a brand that they collaborate with, in this case, Casey, how you're able to strategically launch through content to maximize reach. Because I know even for myself, you know, there have been times where I've partnered with another brand and the strategy, especially the social strategy is almost like an afterthought. It's like, okay, here, here are some deliverables or assets that we've created for you, some graphics. Just go ahead and share, tag us on launch day or launch week. And while I'm sure that, you know, that works in a sense, it's I don't think it's probably the most optimized, most strategic way to make the most of an opportunity like that. So for your team, when you were looking at, okay, we had this opportunity to really get in front of a large audience with Casey, how are we going to make the most of this opportunity? How did you guide that social strategy with her? If you want to get into the granular of like, you know, we created these, these type of assets or we sent this type of launch plan or this is how much we asked her to post over the window of time, anything you're willing to share, we would love to hear. Yeah. So the, the concepts that we talked about were, um, were both of course, just, you know, more announcement messaging, just here are these designs, perfect time of year, holiday gifting, um, and to do the in feed. We also really thought it would be important to see, you know, her, like her engaging with them. And one is, you know, one thing is straight product, but the other is to like, see her engaging. And so um, more kind of story content around um, her actual engaging. So, you know, the things that, yes, we laid out in our strategy and really asked her team for support on were, you know, in feed focusing on the product and then in story focusing on her and her interacting with the product. And then um, because of the timing where the album was just released, she was starting uh, uh, the tour early the next year. So we also, you know, brainstormed and ultimately landed on a way to engage in person on tour. So of course there are the little, you know, merch tables um, uh, at the concerts, but we also wanted to do um, like a giveaway so mid, you know, mid show, there were on the big screens, they'd show like text to enter. Um, and we could, we could do a giveaway and kind of capture the interest that way. Um, and then lastly, there was a uh, national puzzle day. So, you know, there's, there's a day for everything, whatever yes. your, your <laughs> industry is, find your version of it. And I'm sure, I'm sure it exists already. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes when thinking about, obviously, what we do is puzzles, we talk about puzzles all day long, but what we found not just with Casey's team, but others, other partners who are, you know, part of the power of our partnership is that they're in a completely, you know, unrelated um, industry. And so the audience is, is brand new to us. Um, but also, you know, we can't expect them necessarily to like, talk about puzzles all day, every day. And, um, and so beyond, you know, the first few announcement posts and stuff, how do we keep, how do you keep giving anchors for it to make sense for them? So I definitely think, you know, if you're willing to do like product giveaways or, um, gifting to other influencers, that was another strategy we proposed to her team of like, she has a great network. Let's put together a bundle. What's her favorite, you know, female founded wine or liquor company. And, um, she has a candle collaboration, slow burn. So like, can we kind of put together this experience and not only do a giveaway for the audience, but do, um, gifting to her, her network of influencers and celebrities as well. Um, so I think definitely, you know, for anyone listening, taking it on, yourself to really um, propose the strategies and to make it like remove any friction, you know, be willing to create all the assets and draft the posts that, you know, of course they're going to change it, but in your dream world, you know, draft the posts, include all the language that, that you would want um, and really think of what are other ways that at a certain point, you know, th there is going to be a cap on just 
how many times in feed, you know, they're going to talk about puzzles. So what else could it be this, you know, this kit and gifting basically a self-care night to the community or doing in, you know, some IRL stuff and online. And so, um, yeah, we definitely, and, and have taken that through all of our partnerships now of really taking the lead on kind of what, how we could make it holistic and really come from as many angles as possible to, to give it as much as, you know, much shelf life, as many legs as possible. And I think that's right in line with, you know, basically your whole approach to marketing of how can we place puzzles in unexpected places and over and over, right? I'm I'm seeing that come come through in your in your strategy, which I again think is brilliant. I'm curious, you mentioned with this particular partnership that you wanted the product to really be the star of the show in feed. And then for her and her personal interaction with the product to be the star of the show in stories. With unique UTM tracking links, were you able to see which actually converted better? Did, do you have um, any insight on that? I mean, u- ultimately, it would be interesting actually to cap it like for to kind of prorate it per time, you know, just because the feed has now been up a year. So, you know, right. certainly there has been more conversion on feed, but I actually haven't run the numbers and I'd be interested to prorate, you know, for those 24 hours, um, how did how did it convert? Um, but the feed post and, and especially since the design itself, you know, is her. So it does still feel personal. It's, it is her image. Um, and, and the caption being very light and playful and, and kind of in her voice, I think did set it up, um, for, to perform versus, you know, very, a very stock or, or impersonal, um, feed post. But yeah, that's a good question about kind of, prorating it and seeing how that performed. I think it's an important, you know, touch touch point to just see her doing it. And that was something that I really wanted to push for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I was just curious because of that distinction you had made between kind of what was the focus of each of those uh, placements. How did, how did that 97 times increase in content reach translate in terms of clicks and conversions so that this, you know, latter half of the case study, what did you, what did you see? What are some big takeaways that you feel like our listeners could bring into their own either launches or collaborations with other brands? Yeah, I think it was, it was one of our first um, kind of real data points to see that it's entirely the, the, the click through and conversion for a partnership is really dependent on their audience, which I guess sounds fairly self-explanatory. I think when we were, when we were first thinking of all of these, we kind of might have assumed there would be more overlap in that, um, you know, a lot, maybe our existing Jiggy customer base would be interested in this collab. Um, and there definitely is some, but we see that because our audience is, they're coming first and foremost, you know, to to get a puzzle and to get a beautiful puzzle. And so it's a very design driven and art driven decision more so than a, um, you know, a, and especially with our nonprofits, like they, they are activated and they're making their decision based on the art versus whatever the partnership is or the mission behind it. So um, that's, again, why we really take the lead with, you know, laying out all the strategies, all the like wish lists and asks of the partner, because ultimately, you know, the bet is that it's, um, it's their community who, you know, is aligned with, with the mission and um, will ultimately convert. So we saw, I mean, Casey's was one that I think, so we did two designs, um, the one with her, one was a photo of her, one was just part of the album art, which was the star cross and a broken heart and kind of a graphic design. Um, and I think because it was, uh, so much of her kind of 
fan base and hyper engaged audience, the one with her totally outperformed just the graphic design one. Um, you know, fans that were that were activated to get a puzzle, like really were doing it because they want to celebrate Casey and um, and are such fans of hers. So just interesting to see those side by side. One that was, you know, could have been more applicable as more evergreen, wasn't like you know, Casey, Casey front and center. Um, and the other one was, and that one, that one really outperformed. Um, and yeah, we have seen, I mean, versus some of the other partnerships now hers was, was one of the first ones we had done. So we actually have gotten more clarity since then on how it did. And it was, I probably want to say like triple the conversion we've seen on other partnerships. Um, which again, just goes to show, that the, you know, the, the avidness and level of, of engagement of the community is a hundred percent what drives, um, the, you know, the interest. And so fairly self-explanatory, but, um, but, you know, good to validate it just with numbers and make sure that we're then setting up partnerships, um, that either just have such beautiful art, anyone would be attracted to it, whether they, you know, understand what the partnership is or not or that we're really being selective about hyper-engaged um, partner audiences. You know, I I will say that I, I totally get what you mean where you're like, I feel like that is self-explanatory, but also not something you actively think about. Audience crossover is actually something that I've recently, the timing of our conversation is funny because I just... I just wrapped up a podcast um, ad campaign with uh, with Zencaster, and you know we put a budget forth where they disseminated. You know they collected a, a, a you know a group of shows that they felt like had good audience crossover with our listenership, and then had those hosts uh, read host read ads pointing listeners back to our show. And it was interesting because in the recap report in the deck that they sent me when they were looking at audience crossover, they said that. In looking at the click through rates, the the best performing audiences were in the wellness slash lifestyle category. Sometimes with a lower cost per click than in business, even though we're a business show. And Ooh. I found that to be very fascinating. So I, I'm kind of curious, like now that you've done multiple partnerships and even, of course, done your own um, or continue to also sell to your own jiggy audience, what audience have you found to be the best mm -hmm. crossover audience? So not an audience based on a specific personality per se or a brand, but like what type of audience tends to buy puzzles more than others? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it sounds actually fairly consistent with you found, but we definitely have found the, the wellness mindfulness. You know, at first I was wondering if it was going to be avid puzzlers like is our is jiggy appealing to just puzzle lovers who are totally bought in you know do a puzzle a week they get it um and we found that actually the first customer survey we ever ran like over half of our customers had never bought a puzzle before and jiggy was their first jigsaw puzzle you know in years in their adult life and so what that said to me is it was you know, we were really expanding the category and that it was people who were more kind of looking for or open-minded to, um, to a new activity, looking for a way to unwind that they um, either, you know, fell in love with the art. And that was kind of our, our next question. Was it an art-driven decision that you just want to support this artist? Um or is it that you're looking for for that ritual, for that wellness? And it really was the kind of mindful component, you know, this idea of um, of unwinding, getting away from screens, kind of digital detox, you know, that that was really um, what what had resonated. So certainly the mindfulness wellness audience, and then we've seen, you know, just some fun ones like. Um, like book club, you know, book clubbers are, are definitely so strong, not surprised. <laughs> strong crossover. Um, book clubbers are puzzle people. Um, and then actually some surprising ones on like interest based. Um, yeah. So the ski, ski uh, skiers, which you really? know, during ski season, it wasn't necessarily something I had thought of, but it's like, I guess, you know, you're skiing during the day, but 
once you're once you're tired and get off the slopes or you know sun goes down and it's night like you're usually obviously in a cold place you need activity you're like maybe tired and gonna wake up early the next day um so yeah we you know had had found that in some of our um like digital marketing and then participated in like pop-ups in aspen and a couple other ski destinations and so it's fun to just see like what little pockets um there are that that you know then of course it clicks and makes sense but um but didn't anticipate um and 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 actually target um but kind of just happenstance but certainly the mindfulness and wellness is probably the biggest that we've seen um resonate and and kind of be that um the you know of the the home decor or the art or any other kind of angle we go with that the idea of of stress relief and during the pandemic when people were quarantining alone and you know to kind of fight loneliness and anxiety um I have a friend who actually kind of runs a, a grief community and they recommend puzzles as kind of a grief tool to, you know, if there's something about it occupies your mind enough to, you know, kind of quiet your thoughts, kind of be a healthy form of distraction instead of, you know, some unhealthy ones. And um, so it, it passes the time. They are time consuming. It passes the time. It occupies your mind and it can kind of provide a little bit of relief in that way. Oh my gosh. Okay. Another, another pin that I have to put in my mind for after <laughs> the conversation for that particular community. I have a contact that I need to get you in touch with. Um, I, I love this conversation. I'm very fascinated, especially by these niches. Like you mentioned, the ski community, the grief community that you, like when you sit down at a computer and you're launching a brand, you tend to think of like what is the most obvious audience right. that would be engaged with this product. But my takeaway from what Kaylin just shared for all of you listening is this is actually, okay, I'm going to sign a little homework assignment for you all. This yeah. week, <laughs> this week, I want you to think outside the direct, most obvious niche or community of people that would utilize your product or service. So like, just like how Kaylin said, you know, puzzle lovers or home decor would be the obvious one, but you know, through testing ski community and grief community ended up being a big player. Same thing for us. We would think other entrepreneurs or business show listeners would be most attracted to our podcast, but wellness listeners really gravitated toward the content. Try to find the intersection of the why. Like if you're thinking of the Venn diagram, what is that middle component that draws that audience crossover? And you can really utilize what Kaylin has shared here in today's episode. If you don't have a large budget to run paid traffic to test what audiences are working for your brand, maybe it comes in the form of organic partnerships and finding another brand or business who has a community completely different than yours and seeing how your product or service or offer resonates with that community. So that's my mini homework assignment for you all. To wrap up this case study, <laughs> thank you, Kaylin. I mean, you're you're the inspiration for all of this. To wrap up this case study today, um, I would love to know when you just in partnerships at large, how do you how do you uh, structure the licensing or the rev share there? Because I'm sure you know that's something that's new to a lot of us who are p potentially looking to work with another brand or business. And then as a as a tack on to that question, I'm just curious. Um, is puzzles as a platform or these strategic partnerships, is that your primary audience growth channel? Is it the most cost effective one or, or do you have another uh, audience growth tool that has been more effective? Yeah. So firstly, on the kind of structure side, um, it depends. We've done it a couple of ways. One is, you know, if it is a large partner, especially if it's kind of more corporate and there is um, some aspect of, of real licensing that is involved, then you can structure it as either, you know, upfront licensing or like a minimum guarantee against royalties. We generally, can I, I'm so sorry. I just want to jump in real quick. Can you define that for us real quick? Yeah. What does that mean? Minimum guarantee against royalties? Yeah. So typically, and you know, and how we've done it, especially because I you know, self-funded and bootstrapped the business is I was very willing, you know, I wanted, if this does well, everyone does well and we're all happy, but you know, I'm running on cash flow and so can't really go out of pocket up front. And so 
I tried to structure everything around um, rev share on the back end. And so um, how you can do that with the guarantee is basically, you know, based on net proceeds, how are you going to divide up um, the, the profits? And then if the partner is looking for a guarantee, basically the minimum guarantee is that they would make that amount. They would make that guarantee before your portion of the rev share split, you know, kicks in. Um, and if, you know, if it doesn't sell, then most of the time you are still held to that guarantee. So, you know, if it, if it doesn't end up being the success that you expected, then you might go out of pocket. Um, but at least, you know, you've executed, you have, you have it live, you have sales supporting most of that. So there are some partners and I know for bigger, um, bigger companies, sometimes there is a requirement for upfront, but just being so small and, and scrappy, I've tried to really structure everything off, um, kind of back end of sales. And so, um, figuring out the rev split, you know, if there needs to be a guarantee factoring that in. And then, you know, for us, so that's kind of with corporate and for nonprofit, we actually do very high um, percentage going to the nonprofit. So one example, I, my grandmother had Parkinson's. And so we worked with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research and April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. And so there's actually a female artist with Parkinson's who, you know, actually uses painting kind of, you know, her, her um, symptoms, her tremors, which is a big um, symptom of Parkinson's, you know, in her painting and in the brush strokes. And so we used one of her pieces, turned that into a puzzle and then, um, and then sold it in April to raise awareness and dry funds. And so same thing off the back end, we didn't want to, you know, have any kind of um, upfront costs to the nonprofit or risk that we would overproduce and then be sitting on inventory. And so we really de-risked it and essentially just did like a pre-order. You know, we we released it and then we only manufactured the amount that sold. So kept it so smart. Like low risk for everyone. Um, the whole point was to raise money. We didn't want to kind of add barriers to that. So um, those are a couple ways we've done it. And then um, second question. Yeah. Is puzzles as a platform your primary audience growth strategy or do you use something else? It is. And, you know, we've done, we, and we still do, you know, I think performance marketing, I was just talking to someone about this the other day of how she started her business uh, around the same time. And we were like, we missed the window of just like, you go raise VC, you pump it into Facebook ads. And like, there you go. You got a DTC business, like you're done. And you're like, we miss that just like machine. Um, obviously these days, iOS 14 and just so much has changed in that, in the performance marketing world. Um, there is still value, especially, you know, exploring new channels and, and, um, Google and SEO and TikTok and, um, you know, Pinterest, Snapchat, everyone's, you know, still experimenting with them. And we're, predominantly on, you know, Meta, Facebook, Instagram, starting to do some on TikTok. Um, but it's just, I, I like that to, again, kind of experiment with messaging a little bit, see what does resonate, get some of these insights into these like niche audiences. Um, but uh, I don't think it's anything you can like bank on anymore. Um, and it's not as predictable as it once was. You put a dollar in, you get this out. Um, you know, that's really changed. And I think it requires a lot more creativity and a lot more kind of diversifying your bets for acquisition. So yes, you know, outside of just keeping, um, keeping that, you know, turning and, and trying to get as close as we can to a pretty predictable, um, you know, CAC on, on paid channels, um, partnerships and puzzles as a platform really is our, our focus for that audience growth in a more sustainable and organic way. A hundred percent. And I, I, I will say I feel like I'm encouraged by the shift to relational marketing or relationship based marketing, you know, compared to like you mentioned the years prior where it is so paid traffic, so performance driven. So mm -hmm. I kind of love that return. It kind of feels in line with, you know, every everything that you do and and how community oriented you are. So Kaylin, I am so grateful for your time today. 
Uh, our final question that we ask all of our guests, what does being a CEO mean to you? And then if you want to also share you know, how our listeners can support Jiggy, can go buy Jiggy, um, anything you're excited about, feel free to tack that on to the end as well. Yes, totally. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I loved our conversation today. Um, you know, to me, being a CEO, and it's, it still feels new, three three plus years in, um, but I'm really figuring out how to lead authentically and to, um, to, to stay true to what I started and to do it my way. And I think sometimes, you know, I talk to people who, who are aspiring entrepreneurs or, or have an idea. And I think there's a lot of focus on like tech CEOs and, you know, zero to one and has to be brand new, innovative, never seen before, never done before. And sometimes I'm like, it might be right in front of you. You know, like I'm not, I didn't create a brand. I didn't innovate how to manufacture a puzzle. You know, I brought my unique angle to it and I brought um, my kind of authenticity and purpose to it. And so I think sometimes, you know, how, um, what's your, what's your spin? What's your, um, you know, why are you the person to, to bring that thing into the world? And so that's what being a CEO means to me. And yes, would love to connect with everyone and, uh, and check us out. We're Jiggy Puzzles everywhere, jiggypuzzles.com. Um, and at Jiggy Puzzles is our handle for all social. Amazing. Well, I love that wisdom, by the way, that it's not about reinventing the wheel, but bringing your unique perspective to something, your unique experience to something. So such great advice. Make sure you check out Jiggy Puzzles. We'll link everything below for you in the show notes. So scroll below, give them a follow, uh, try a puzzle. I'm excited to try my first Jiggy Puzzle. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you. I appreciate it.